I'd like to welcome you all to the 19th meeting of the Social Security Committee and uh, warmly welcome you to this roundtable um, discussion. Um, I have a few apologies this morning. Apologies from our convener, Bob Doris, which is why I'm in the chair, and also from Mark Griffin. If everyone could do the usual and just check that your mobile phones are either on silent or off, that would be really helpful. Um, Agenda item number one, to ask the committee members if they would agree to taking agenda item three and item four on our work programme in private. Is that agreed? Thank you very much. Uh, so that takes us to the main item of business, which is benefit take up. And that's going to be the discussion for the next um, hour and a half or so. Um, can I just ask everyone, I know the temptation is to press your button in front of you. Um, we have Alan in sound here. You'll handle it also. Don't, don't touch anything, if you don't mind. Um, just speak, and Alan will put you on the, on the system. Um, so I just want to do the introductions first of all. I know probably we, everyone knows, probably everyone else, we've had many of you in front of the committee before, but um, just for the public record. So we have Lynn Naven, who's the Public Health Research Specialist at Glasgow Centre for Population Health. We have Chris Goulden, Deputy Director of Evidence and Impact of the Joseph Rowntree Foundation. Neil Cowan, Policy and Parliamentary Officer for the Poverty Alliance. Stephen McAvoy, Senior Welfare Rights Advisor at Enable Scotland. Russell Gunson, Director and Institute for Public Policy at Research Scotland. Rob Gowan, Senior Policy Officer, Citizens Advice Bureau. And Leslie Newton, who's the Deputy Manager in Vernes, Badenoch, Strasby and Citizens Advice Bureau. So, Welcome to you all. Um, so the way we tend to run roundtable discussions is probably like you do most of the talking, but let members come in and ask some questions to keep the discussions flowing. I'm going to aim to finish the discussion around 10.30 and ask you all um, what action you'd like to see the committee take or ask for, um, and then finish at quarter to 11. Um, so really looking forward to this, and I'd like to... I ask Jeremy Balfour to ask the first question. Uh, uh, good morning, Camino, uh, and good morning, everybody. I suppose the first question, just as a kind of starter, is around uh, take-up. Do you think take-up is lower, not 100%, not because people are either not aware of the benefits that are out there, they find the whole process is too difficult and that's not worth doing, um, or is there still a stigma within certain parts of society to say we don't take things from the state and thus, you know, even if you give me the form and sign it for me and everything, I still don't want to have it. So I suppose it's just trying to work out why do you think take up is low? Is there a primary reason or a, or a number of reasons which from your experience that takes place? So I think it's an important first question. So if everyone wants to and we'll start with Leslie. Um, Obviously, speaking from someone who works at the coalface in a citizen's advice bureau for the last 27 years, I know I don't look old enough, but <laughs> yeah. um, at the end of the day, I think all three of those are a, a major contributing factor to it. The complexity, many of the clients don't actually know what to ask when they come in. We identify things that they were never even aware of. Um, clearly, the help to claim universal credit and the um, money matters teams that are being funded uh, money matters teams by you in particular um, highlight to people but it's getting them on the phone um, and it's encouraging people who come in contact with the public in all sectors it's very important that they are given an insight into what is an offer I think we don't share enough information with agencies like doctors social workers schools we don't actually make sure that people fully know what they're aware of what, what, what is out there the, the system is very complex. I have a team of welfare rights advisors who spend an inordinate amount of their working day trying to challenge these decisions which are poorly made. Get it right first time would be my mission when you guys take over from um, the DWP with your disability assistance uh, programme because we are winning these appeals but they take an inordinate amount of time to sort out. And the, the system is quite complex. These forms are very complex, and I think a lot of the information is already available to you. Uh, Tellings once might be a concept that we really need to explore, that there's lots of agencies know lots about people, but they don't all work together, and people get very frustrated. I think also the mental health sector is a major problem. People with mental health pro uh, issues 
find it very, very challenging even to come over our door. And it, it's something that you really need to address. Thank you. Thank you. Lynn. I would agree with Leslie, um, particularly around the point about um, lack of awareness of entitlement. Um, I'm representing, um, amongst other things, the Healthier Wealthier Children project, which um, is a referral pathway from health visitors and midwives to money advice services. And when we evaluated that project, uh, we found that the majority of people were totally unaware of their entitlement and um, had never been to a money advice service before. So that's a huge thing. And the other thing, of course, from working on um, projects in the NHS um, involving universal services is that um, certainly when you have trusted professionals um, referring people, it does help to remove the stigma. So um, that is a huge, a huge benefit. Thank you. So that's all. Chris? Um, yes, I agree. It's all, all of those levels. Um, it's awareness in the first place, and then it's the application process, and then it's around access to the benefit itself where action is needed. Um, but probably the biggest, by far the biggest area is around people who just don't know the benefit exists. And we have fairly good estimates, which are in the background paper to this meeting about which benefits are, are, are kind of better or worse in terms of take up, but there are some uh, particularly disability benefits and importantly universal credit where we really have no idea what the scale of non-take up is. But if, if we are going to have a long-term strategy to improve take up, which would be my, my main recommendation, that has to be an ongoing strategy because it's, it's, it's never gonna end. It needs constant pressure to, to keep people aware and applying and accessing the benefits. Thank you. Neil? <clears throat> I would support what's um, already been said. So I guess it is a, absolutely a combination of the three factors that you mentioned, Jeremy. So awareness, uh, complexity and stigma. So in terms of awareness, um, one of the community activists that we work with um, said to me, fundamentally, it's impossible to have knowledge of or apply for something that you don't know exists. Mm. And so if someone doesn't know exists, they're obviously not going to, to access their entitlement. And I think particular groups have particularly low levels of awareness. So um, from, from speaking with our community activists, I think people in work often don't um, fully understand what they're entitled to and so don't um, claim it. Often people who have perhaps been in work for 20 or 30 years who haven't had, haven't been at, in uh, having to access the social security system but find themselves perhaps out of work or the circumstances have changed and um, they find that you know they don't again know what their entitlements are so i think awareness is um is a big factor and um, complexity as well um, a lot of people just find it hugely complex um, to to navigate the system so again one of our community activists was telling me about how um, he, he has a visual impairment and um, it took him 11 and a half hours to complete his universal credit claim so um you know hugely hugely complex system um, and then stigma again i think years of um, people's quite negative experiences with the system um, have have left people with you know large levels of stigma, and that you know encourages people often to, to disengage entirely from um, from the system. But there's other factors as well. So adequacy, for example, we know that the higher the value of a benefit, the higher the take up, um, and also things like conditionality and sanctions in the previous years and in, in the last few years, particularly. Um, have led to, I think, more people disengaging with the system as well. So I think it's the factors that you mentioned, but, but others as well. Thank you. Rob? Yeah, I'd, um, I'd agree with um, the points that have been made so far, and I think it's it's um, it's not one thing, it's a, it's a combination. Um, in, in sort of preparation of this, we did a, um, a survey of CAB, CAB advice across the country about what they thought were the the sort of the top um, the top reasons um, the top three that um, as mentioned were people not knowing that they're entitled um, the application or the assessment process is too complicated um, and the third one which I don't think has been mentioned so far is people struggling to make and manage claims online which has been a, a particularly recent um, recent issue for um, for people claiming universal credit and has, has created an additional barrier for um, uh, for people um, claiming, um, we've um, the sort of systems by Scotland's done um, sort of research over the last um, the last six years, which has consistently found that um, it's around um, sort of one in five people sort of aren't able to um, sort of use the um, 
sort of make and manage claims, um, claims online, and just the majority of people would, wouldn't be able to make a, a claim for benefits online without, without help, which is what, um, 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 what's been a, a sort of an additional, an additional barrier um, to, um, to take up in the system. Thank you. Russell? Um, just in terms of adding to what's been said rather than repeating, um, so the stigma seems to be from the evidence to be more of a problem for some benefits than for others. So for example, there seems to be less of a stigma in claiming child-related payments than for others. And you can see that actually in the turnout figures or take-up figures, should I say, um, for the benefits as you've seen in the briefing. But also there's take-up um, problems for particular groups within uh, the the clients or beneficiaries you're trying to target. So there's harder to reach um, groups, if that's the right term, that equally there may be some specific um, needs in terms of awareness raising, in terms of uh, simplicity of forms. And then again, just to add to what others have said rather than duplicate, in Scotland we've got a particular issue around take up in the sense that a lot of the benefits that are coming on stream are ones that are passported from UK benefits. So if you like um, universal credit, hopefully we'll get up to 85%, maybe even higher than that take up. But if we have any drop off from that between the universal credit and the, the benefits that we're paying, that take up can only ever be at a max 85% or lower, more likely. So how do we get to those people that are eligible, but maybe not taking up UK benefits so that they can then access Scottish payments? Steve? Points is we've got a complicated system where you could have somebody who's entitled to three or four different benefits and unless they speak to an advice agency that actually takes the time to say this is what each individual benefit is for, people can just be receiving payments with no real concept of what the payments are actually intended for and if you don't have a great understanding of a system you're just less likely to engage with it. Um, so if anything changes you might not realise what you need to report or seek further advice about what else you should claim. Um, the next kind of thing is the level of stages involved in making a claim. Um, so the personal independence payment, you'll have your initial phone call, you'll then probably have a form and then you'll probably have an assessment. Universal credit, you'll make your claim online, you'll have an appointment at the job centre. Most claims have got various different stages involved and unless somebody has properly took through all that, what they can expect, what they should be providing, there's just opportunities for people, even when they've made the claim, to actually drop out of the system. Um, the third problem then is just poor administration. People will get told they're not entitled to a benefit that they should be. And if they're speaking to a decision-making body, they might only have knowledge of that one particular benefit at best. Um, and they might not actually advise the person, well, you could actually get this as well. And again, it's not until they speak to an advice agency that actually looks at the full picture that somebody's properly advised, well, you might actually get this as well. And if that's refused, then there's a process to challenge it. Thank you. Lynn, did you want to come back in? I just wanted to add something to what Chris said about um, working consistently to, to encourage and in increase uptake. Um, from our work, um, we've also realised that you have to work consistently to engage professionals in referring people um, for benefits. Um, this work shouldn't be underestimated at all. It takes a lot of work. In the Healthier Wealthier Children project at the beginning, um, we had, when it was fully funded, we had a health worker, a health improvement worker working jointly with a money advice worker to go around to all the health visiting and midwifery teams and to promote the pathway, the referral pathway, to give them information about child poverty, um, to develop resources for them, uh, information resources and handy ready reckoners and everything for them and for clients. And... Um, and also, um, they developed a, a non-contact protocol so that, you know, if money advice services were trying to contact people who were referred, um, they had a protocol to follow uh, five steps to try and contact the person before they gave up. But all these things are so important and they have to be reinforced all the time because new staff come on board and, um, you know, they have to be reinforced all the time and they require resources. So, um, just to bear that in mind, and also the other thing that was important for, for increasing uptake was performance monitoring, because it sort of um, 
encourages visibility within systems and it also encouraged uh, people to refer. So that, that's another point to make. Thank you. Leslie? Picking up the point about universal credit, I think, I think we've found as a citizen's advice service that we have real concerns that not all the options are explored with uh, clients before they come to us and that contribution-based benefit could be a better option than actually having to claim universal credit. And I have real concerns that there is a mission within the DWP to just get people onto UC irrespective of their background and requirements. And digital de by default, the, the point um, that Stephen raised, I have real concerns that we are causing major problems with clients who don't have computer skills. And we also have the language barriers. Um, we're experiencing a significant uplift in EU citizens getting right to reside in correct decisions, which present, prevents them from getting um, benefits. So I, I really have a concern that it's not getting people onto benefits, it's making sure that all options are explored. And we need the resources to do that, because to train and develop volunteers to go through that complex system is not easy and it's important that we look at what we require to ensure that everybody gets what they're entitled to and uh, it, it's, it's something that is, is quite pertinent at the moment because we, we have massive requirement to recruit more volunteers because we are hemorrhaging volunteers because the role is very complex. We're hemorrhaging staff because the, the salaries out in the community um, in some areas are much higher to do a similar if not less stressful job. So it, it, it's, it's a number of things and that the, the fallout of benefit take-up is that we need to make sure that we've got fully trained people to assist and explore all options with members of the society who are entitled to certain things. We will find that there will be a problem as well when we've got devolved and non-devolved mixed scenarios <laughs> because that will be complex for us to manage, never mind explain to members of the public, excuse me, you've got this agency helping you with this set of benefits and you've got this agency helping you with the other and we need to be able to manage that and we need to be mindful of that. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so the committee have um, a table in our papers of the teacup and it's, it's across the UK and it breaks it down pension credit housing benefit. One of the um, benefits that seems extremely low uptake is the working tax credit families without children benefit at 31%. Um, the best start grant is 53%, which strikes me as quite low compared to housing benefit income support, which is 80%. I suppose some of that might be obvious as to why there would be a gap. Just wanted to throw that open as to if you had any thoughts as to why some of these benefits uptakes are so low. Hey, Chris. Um, on working tax credit, it's a function of what was mentioned earlier, that people in work are just less aware or, or expect that there are fewer benefits available to them. So child tax credits, there's, there are kind of other gateways to that through other child benefits, and there's greater awareness. And obviously, child tax credits, you can get in and out of work. So the movement in and out of work doesn't affect your benefit in the, in the same way, whereas working tax credits, you obviously, by definition, have to be in work. Um, and the, that group that you've highlight, highlighted without children don't have any other way, really, of finding out about the benefit. So that is one of the things that universal credit should address is that there are other kind of built-in gateways to getting your full benefit, including what would be replacing working tax credit through, through, uh, through other means. So we should see that remedied through universal credit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Steve? Um, tax credits, working tax credits for people without children will um, tend to be disabled workers and that's reliant usually on another qualifying benefit. So again, you've got that system where one's impacting on the other. So if somebody's on DLA, moved to PIP, told they're not entitled, that would then potentially stop the tax credits. And it's that um, complexity with interaction between two benefits. Um, the other issue with tax credits is it's just the way it's designed that your award is partly based on the previous year and what you estimate you will earn in the year going forward. So if you've got somebody who's not particularly savvy with numbers, um, they're really, really going to struggle to make that estimate accurately. Um, so there are potentially loads of people who are estimating wildly um, outside of what the actual figure will be and potentially being told that they're not entitled. 
Russell. First place is that it's very, very difficult to get accurate figures around take up. So um, it's easier for some benefits than for others. But a number of those um, stats will be estimates and some will be more accurate than others. Um, around the Scottish based benefits in particular, as I say, there's an, there's an element that might be the fact that um, you're talking about a potential uh, take up uh, drop off twice. So there's a take up drop off in terms of um, claiming the UK wide benefit uh, that allows you to passport to your best start grant, for example, and there'll be a drop off for that second step as well. But the, the big health warning on those is their, their projections from the Scottish Fiscal Commission, I think. Uh, and we'll, we'll have to see as Best Start Grant is rolled out, it's very early days, as to whether the, the take-up figures outstrip those forecasts. Well, yeah, I think, um, I think following on from those points, I think there's an importance of, um, as part of a take-up strategy of getting um, sort of as good estimates as possible of, of take-up rates um, across the benefits. Um, some of the, um, the take-up rates uh, that um, have been published by D DWP are, are now sort of several years old. Um, some of them um, aren't necessarily based on the most, the most up-to-date information. And some of the benefits, then, we don't, don't have official estimates. Um, to, um, the disability benefits being a uh, one, so I, th I think there's um, it's important to um, to get that right. Um, if if we're sort of going to have an idea of of sort of where um, what the levels of, of underclaiming are, um, I guess a sort of a, a sort of another way of um, at it um, would be from um, sort of uh, sort of client financial gain from. Um, from CAB, so from over the last um, the last year, um, achieved a client financial gain of over eighty four million pounds in Scotland in benefit payments. Um, Thirty million of that related to personal independence payment, sixteen million to DLA, and ten million to Universal Credit. When we asked advisors what um, what they thought the most likely or which benefits were underclaimed, uh, the, the majority um, said personal independence payment. Um, majority said attendance allowance and just under half um, those carers allowance and funeral payments um, all of which um, are, are sort of benefits that are, that are sort of due to be devolved so um, there's potentially um, opportunities there um, on the best start grant um, is probably um, it's sort of in some sense it's sort of too early to say um, what the um, um, the sort of the level of actual underclaiming is um, that, that certainly the, um, the the figures that um, or the numbers of people who um, have received the benefit is sort of far higher than the short start maternity grant that it replaced, but with different eligibility criteria. Um, you know, one of the, the things that um, that uh, that CAB clients have told um, us um, so, so far is that um, some have not um, claimed Best Start grant because they need to claim universal credit and they're they're concerned about um, about claiming that. So the the sort of um, the sort of the the kind of the concern and the worry about potentially being um, being sanctioned about the the sort of the process that will need to go through has sort of led them to say, well, uh, sort of. Um, um, I'll, I'll sort of, I'll try and cope without the, without the, the money. Thank you. Anyone else? Jeremy? Could I just ask a question, going back to what a lot of you have said, is that people just don't know about the benefits, whether they're in work or in other ways. And we talk a lot about social media, we talk a lot about advertising campaigns, but Clearly, they, they are not working. I suppose the idiot guide for me is what would get that message to those who are not claiming? You know, how, how, you know we can have a big inquiry and we can come up with lots of ideas, but, you know, with due respect, probably not many people are listening to us. So how do we get that message to, if you like, average person who should be claiming? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think certainly um, we shouldn't um, focus on the onus on people to claim. We should 
focus on helping them to get the benefits that um, that they need. Um, I I suppose that's the whole point. It's how how you organise it so that there are advocates for people um, and particularly trusted professionals. I think that really works very well in the health service um, across all the referrals. Um, you know, it's it's. Um, there's no stigma involved, it's all trusted professionals and, um, and they have good uptake rates. For example, one part of the Healthier Wealthier Children initiative was in the Children's Hospital in Glasgow and um, that's across clinical, um, uh, clinical uh, sectors. So um, they have 94% uptake uh, because it's a co-located thingy that they're uh, money advisors are there in the hospital um, and now they've introduced a new system whereby they actually have um, a routine inquiry question on the admission form for sick kids so that um, this is a question about do you have money worries. It's a routine inquiry question in midwifery and health visitor uh, records as well so so that they can flag up immediately. So it's it's that preventative approach really before people have crisis before um, it gets so bad that they, that, you know, that they really badly need the service. It's that preventative aspect of it that, that we think is, is quite important. Chris, did you want to go in? Yeah, so, I mean, if, if I was coming up with a strategy for Scotland around benefit take-up, I would have a kind of rolling national campaign that picked off different benefits because um, you have to keep reminding people that they exist. Uh, and Previous campaigns at the national level uh, from Westminster have, have been effective in the past, so pension credit and tax credits, the kind of general awareness raising campaigns uh, several years ago were effective at uh, increasing take up of those benefits to a certain level. But you have to keep going because it's obviously new people are coming on the scene to potentially claim the benefit all the time. That's why you can never uh, kind of stop your campaign and think that it's all done because we we know that local take-up campaigns do work if people are engaged with professionals that you know many are sat around the table and they get the advice they need they will get the benefits they need but more more people are just coming down the track not aware or not able to access for reasons of complexity or access to proper advice all the time so that's why that kind of rolling campaign at the national level uh, is needed as well as that local action and then the one-to-one -one support so that it's those three levels the national the kind of local system and then the one-to-one -one advice that needs to be part of that strategy so before i ask russell to come in and then alistair allen wants to ask a question um, it, it would seem an appropriate point to just add to the discussion that the committee have been looking at the whole question of whether automating some benefits could make the difference. Um, in fact, uh, in last year we had some sessions with the previous minister on looking at examples around the country. Some local authorities like Glasgow and Ayrshire have already done this, but what's now standing in the way of that is the New Data Protection Act, where everybody seems to be going totally overboard with protection of information. And the committee are quite interested in that providing some solution. I would also add into the discussion, um, you may recall when we did the scrutiny of the Social Security Act and the creation of the new agency, there is a duty in there in the new agency. And the committee are quite specific to add that in for those who supported it. Um, to ensure that there was a duty on the officials of the new agency to someone approaches on one benefit, they should be looking to see whether or not they're entitled to any others. And I just thought I'd add that in and be welcome any response that you had to that, oh, Russell. Yeah, I think, so firstly, on awareness raising, there is a lot of evidence to suggest, just as Chris says, that they do work. Um, when they're done, it's just there's far less being done probably at the UK level than in the past. And at the Scottish level, that's just winding up as the new benefits are devolved. Um, so it's not that they don't work, it's just that we're not doing as much as we probably should. Alongside that awareness sort of public publicity campaign, as Chris says, and has been talked about by a few participants today, that trusted advice, that trusted sort of contact points, the co-location of services that allows people to understand that they are potentially eligible for benefits and to help people to apply. 
Um, again, that's easier, I would argue, for a more stable group uh, in the sense of a stable pool of people that may be um, eligible for benefits, whereas for other benefits, so a stable pool would be, for example, child-related benefits, it's much more likely that you will uh, understand that you are eligible for that benefit than, for example, um, some uh, disability benefits. People will be changing their elig eligibility quite um, quickly. Um, on automation, so absolutely, so we're very interested in what automation can do in the Scottish context to uh, drive as high take-up as we can possibly get. And I think there's a few elements to that. So there's, um, in the short term, maybe we can't go to automation across the board, given capacity issues at the agency as we roll out. But what we shouldn't do is rule out automation for some streams. So take, for example, the new Scottish Child Payment, uh, the very... We're, hugely supportive of it. It's coming a little earlier in 2020 now. Um, you could begin to automate for some legacy benefits, such as child tax credit. Um, and as you can see from the take-up figures you have, that's got high penetration into that, um, that cohort. If you can automate for that benefit, you could probably bite off quite a large proportion of the people um, eligible for the Scottish child payment. Um, so automation over the long term for all, I think we'd be very interested in looking at how you can make that possible. Automation in the short term for some. And you're right to suggest that GDPR isn't a block to this necessarily. So if you ask, uh, if you ask at the start for people's data to be used in a certain way, it can be. And I think as much as the design of the Scottish Child Payment, as much as the take up of that payment is incredibly important, this is one of those issues that's a bit of a Cinderella one potentially how we can collect data through the Scottish Child Payment and the other Scottish-based benefits that allow us to use those benefits as a gateway to other forms of financial and non-financial help could be a bit of a holy grail. Um, because whilst, of course, maximising people's financial help is very important, going beyond that into some of the non-financial help we can offer, those groups of people could be a very different approach to Social Security compared to, to down south. So yeah, on, on local awareness campaigns, they do work. On automation, there are opportunities in the short term and in the long term. Thank you. Uh, just to conclude, and before I ask Alistair Allen to um, ask his question, um, Shirley Ann Somerville wrote to the committee on the 30th of May 2019, which will be in the public record on the committee website. It is worth having a look at that, if you haven't already. Uh, but just to quote a bit from it, unfortunately, there's no current legal gateway for sharing DWP data for the purposes of targeting free school meals and clothing grants, which is the ones that we were interested in in Scotland. Furthermore, a legal gateway can only be established by UK government legislation. But she goes on to say, however, as you know in your letter, there is a legal gateway which allows the DWP to share data with councils for the purpose of checking free school meals eligibility in England and Wales. So there's a clear precedent. So it's worth having a look at that. Alistair Allen. Okay, thank you, Convener. I'm afraid I'm going to ask a provocative question, um, but I'm just going to ask it anyway. Um, if Citizens Advice Bureau uh, has a campaign for benefits take-up and it results in increased take-up of benefits, as, as you were talking about, um, it's not penalised for doing that. It's not fined for doing that. But, you know, there is more than some talk. There's some indication that we, we may be moving to a, a position where there's a political pressure for the Scottish Government. I don't want to use the word sanction, but the Scottish Government... Um, to have to stump up the cash for what looks like any increased take-up of, of UK benefits that happen as a result of its efforts. Now, we're not there yet, but it looks very much like we're possibly heading in that direction. Is that a sustainable position if we're looking for the Scottish Government to encourage people to take up benefits? I think, um, I mean, the short answer would be no. I mean, the, the idea that the UK government should be assuming anything other than 100% take-up and therefore arguing that it's the Scottish government's um, fault and therefore they should stump up the cash for getting take-up above the current levels and towards 100% seems to me to be certainly running against the spirit of the fiscal framework and maybe, or even the, the written um, sort of line by line of it. Um, so to me, it doesn't seem sustainable. It may not, it could be quite a risk averse interpretation of the fiscal framework too and I think also you've got to look at given the lack of data around current levels of take up whether it was it's a theoretical possibility of course but whether it's one in practice that could happen um, 
is, is another matter. I also think there's a, there's a distinction between what the agency and the Scottish Government are doing to boost take-up and what the Government are helping and supporting the third sector and others to do to boost take-up. Um, so what I'd hate to see is, is, whether from the UK Government or the Scottish Government, an aversion to boosting UK benefits because actually given the way the Scottish benefit system is, or the social security system is developing, we are passporting almost all of our benefits to UK-wide ones. And so without boosting UK take-up, there'll be a ceiling um, under which we could never, uh, never go above. Alison Johnson. Thank you, convener. Um, I think the point has been well made by the contributions this morning of the importance of actually the, the literature review that was carried out by the Centre for Economic and Social Inclusion um, found that one of the major findings of studies of benefit take-up was the importance of access to and the availability of services with trained staff able to provide um, independent and authoritative welfare rights information, advice and support. And I think both um, Lynn and Leslie have, have picked up on that issue. Um, Lynn in particular, you know, just the trust that people have with trained professionals, even if they're in another field, um, sort of signposting and referring services. Um, and I think Leslie's made the point that if we don't have... How difficult it is to attract volunteers, how difficult it is to attract staff in a competitive environment... Um, so I'm just wondering, is the welfare rights, you know, environment in Scotland in a, you know, is it in a strong enough place to help people at the moment? Do we have enough staff in post? Is there enough focus on that? Steve. It's concerns about this quite a lot. Um, since I started in advice, the level of complexity has, has really, really skyrocketed. Um, it's getting increasingly more difficult to actually work out people's entitlement. Sometimes you're actually having to look at changes that might happen in the future as well. Um, so, for example, in January, we had a gateway introduced, which potentially meant that a lot of vulnerable claimants could stay outside of the universal credit system. Um, we knew that was potentially going to come in for a while, but the regulations were passed through really late. Um, so you're even having to sort of forward plan in terms of your advice. And um, we're really going to have to work on... Um, retention in terms of, one, getting new staff in, but also making sure that they've got a body of experienced staff that they can actually learn from in the way that I did um, when I was new to uh, welfare rights. Um, and I think that's kind of one of the things that goes back to automation as well, um, about how difficult that's ever going to be to actually fully replicate the, the job that we do. Um, I spoke to a client recently who, um, due to a change in circumstances, um, was advised that they had to claim universal credit, whereas I was able to advise them that if they actually got their ESA claim changed first, they would then be able to claim housing benefit because that gateway would apply to them. So there was no system automation that I can think of that was ever actually going to be able to properly advise the person that. They really needed somebody who had an, an awareness of the, the, the full system. Um, it, sometimes it's not even directly what we think of social security benefits either. Um, I might speak to a, a carer um, with a partner's working and tell them about the marriage allowance. Um, it might be council tax discounts and, and things like that that are only traditionally seen as even being um, social security. Um, so unless you've got a real, real body of trained advisors who are actually able to go through everything with that person about the system, um, it's going to be a struggle. And at the minute, I, I think there's a real lack of supply of that. One of the areas that we put within the Social Security Act was the right to independent advice. Uh, and that's one of the things that I think there was cross-party agreement on. Is it your position that uh, that we need that advice from the start? So uh, I've heard some people saying that the agency might give that advice up until the point that you end up at a tribunal. But would your position be that the advice needs to be all the way through from when that person wants to make the claim? So my, my preference is basically that, that everybody would get a benefit check um, rather than wait until there's a, a particular problem. So at the very early stage of the, the process for me would be it. Um, I think the legislation as well actually it, it kind of gives right to advocacy, which I, I know there's a consultation on that, which is a, a slightly different thing. Um, from the, the service that we would provide in terms of benefit checks. But my position would always be 
um, get a check for the very start. And I think a lot of that comes from professionals, as, as Lynn had mentioned, just referring somebody. Can we check that everything's all right? Um, just last week, I got a referral for a GP practice, went out to see the person, helped with the forum, but discovered that their carer was actually missing out on more than £50 a week in pension credit. Um, so if that referral for that check had never been made, that person would still be missing out on that. And that wasn't even anything really related to mm. the, the forum that had come in. Um, and I also think it's back that we, we as the advice sector, it's important that we get back to referrals as well so they actually see the end benefit. So when I was, can I met that client, I go back to the, the GP practice and says, thanks for making that referral. Here's what I've done. Here's what the person was missing out on. So hopefully in the future, they actually see the benefit as well rather than sort of referring into a black hole. Alison, did you want to come back on that? Yeah, I mean, I think the point has been... <laughs> Of contributions this morning have suggested that take up of benefits around children are per perhaps there's less stigma there. But you know, is it there's less stigma, or is it at the point that you know when children become part of your life, you're more in touch with a variety of professionals and organisations? You know, it's notable that child benefit take up I think is at 93%. The new baby box is 94%. So those things seem to to run in parallel. But I'm just wondering as well if there's a lot of the figures we have around take-up are aggregate figures, and we've not drilled down into them. You know, are there groups within those figures that are particularly, you know, far from taking up benefits like BME Scots or younger people? Do we have any information on that? Anyone? Jess? Um, well, yeah, BME is definitely an issue and language barriers in terms of understanding. Um, it creates an extra... Uh, hoop to jump through for, for lots of people. So yeah, I don't think there's very good statistical information about that because the data that you've got in your paper and that is published by DWP doesn't really go into much depth, but potentially there is a lot more there to dig into. If uh, in Scotland there was interest, um, I think a lot could be done to improve the quality of the information we have about who is missing out because at the moment, you're right, it's very, it's very superficial. But in, ter in terms of uh, stigma, it does depend it, it varies by group. So if you look at the pension credit rate, it's still only 60%, which is, which is woeful. Um, and typically pensioners would be considered, you know, as part of the, in, in quotes, deserving poor in the same way that, that children would be. But you're still seeing an extremely low rate for them. And there are particular issues around uh, the felt stigma among older people about uh, engaging with, with uh, what they perceive as the benefit system beyond, beyond the basic pension. Michelle Valentin? No, I was actually indicating that Neil's been trying to get in for the last few. <laughs> oh, sorry, Neil, on your call. I'm just um, going to make a similar point to Chris. I think um, in terms of the particular groups that aren't taking up what they're entitled to, I think BME groups, at least anecdotally, um, have you know, relatively low take-up rates. I think young lone parents as well. But I think the evidence base isn't great. Um, so I think that's certainly something that you know more work on that would be really welcome. I think, for example, um, Best Start Grant stats as far as I understand, it aren't um, segregated by gender. Um, I don't think the equalities data is particularly rigorously collected as part of that application process. So I think um, there's certainly more that can be done to develop that evidence base, which would help us in turn better target interventions to boost take up. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the issue of lone parents, Neil, because it's certainly my experience that working with the Lone Parent Family Scotland, um, they see particularly ones who are working and working full time, which if you have a child above a certain age and you're required to, is you simply you don't even have time to take up an appointment at uh, an advice centre. So probably specifically working, they're not going to really come into contact with um with any agency. Steve. Um you mentioned that child benefit take up's really high um, and also child benefits in general. Um, but one of the groups I find that still miss out are parents of a child with a disability. Um, particularly my client group um, when the child has a learning disability because often that can take so long to be diagnosed that parents will hold off thinking that they need that diagnosis before they can claim the disability benefit and a lot of the time it's access to the disability benefits that will then increase the tax credits or give them access to other things and when they're waiting on the diagnosis they're still having to attend the appointments they're maybe getting called to their work to pick the child up for school Sometimes a parent maybe has to reduce hours or give up a job. So you've actually got that acute financial crisis and parents are waiting until they get that diagnosis potentially until they make the claim or while still they're making the claim and poor administration means that they're getting refused. 
or even if they make the claim for the disability benefit, nobody's making that next step to say you're actually now entitled to an increased amount of tax credits or you might be entitled to carers allowance or you might be entitled to all these different things. Um, and again, it's maybe not until they speak to an advice agency that they actually get that information. So although we might look at the, op the top line figure and think tax credit take up for parents looks quite high, there is still a group within that that are potentially missing out quite significantly. Michelle Valentin. Yeah, uh, this is actually quite interesting because there's obviously a few reasons that we seriously need to look at. But I, I'm interested in the fact, that particularly from what you're saying, Stephen, that there seems to be two things here. There's the sort of on average around 20 odd percent that are not claiming, and we need to understand why. You know, is is because I, I met a family the other day that I was trying to persuade to to actually take up benefits, and they were saying, "Well, we're managing." You know, I don't see why. And I was saying, well, because you're entitled to them and, and it would improve your life. So there the seems there's a funny group as well that, that actually are actively choosing not to not to apply. But I, So there's that bit about understanding. But you also seem to be saying, Stephen, that even within the percentage that are claiming, there's also an issue in terms of you think that they're, they're not getting everything they could get. So there might be a cross-reference here where somebody is in the say 93% that are getting child benefit and, and maybe within the 83% of child tax credit on these figures. Um, and I would just say that obviously these figures go back to 2016-17, so they may not reflect what is happening now. Um, but if, if we took those as, as an average or a red, then actually when you look then across and say, well, you know, the best start grant or whatever, the funeral support, aren't getting such high figures, they're the same people who've possibly just missed out because they didn't know. Um, but when you say everybody should see an advisor, do you really mean everybody or do you mean that percentage that are not getting benefits? Because, I, I mean, there's a big difference between 100% of people should go and see an advisor and actually there's a cohort of 30% that really ought to see an advisor. You know, uh, where are we going with that? I think, I mean, we could narrow it down. They'd be very, very wide groups. Um, so, for example, parents could get a benefit check, um, people with disabilities. Again, that's quite easy to tie in with the, who will, what professionals will these people be seeing? Um, so you wouldn't necessarily need to target 100% of the population, but it would be a very, very wide um, speak with the population, even if you're just looking at parents, that, that's going to be a, a huge figure of people. But what I tend to find is that if somebody's just coming to me for a benefit check and they've got all the information, it, it doesn't really take that long to actually just do that check. So although there's, there is a lack of resource, it, per person, it's not a huge issue if somebody's getting everything just to take a couple of minutes to double check it and go, that's, that, that's fine. Um, and it would actually save a lot of work further down the line. It's, it's like health-based problems. The longer you leave them, the worse they will get. So if the person doesn't get a benefit check at the early possible stage, they just end up coming to you when a crisis has actually arisen. And that's when things are a lot more expensive to fix. So logically, when somebody applies for a benefit, whatever benefit it is, there ought to be some automatic check in place then, logically. That, that, that's certainly what I would like to see. So that's not necessarily about going to a special advisor. That's about a principle within the application. I think you would still need somebody specialist to actually carry that out, um, just just based purely on the amount of things that you would need to know. Right, okay. And you said, obviously, about children's stuff and, and, and disabled people, but actually the lowest take-up on this table that we have is the working tax credit people without children, the very people who don't come into contact with advisors or supporters. So they would possibly be the people that most need a health check. I, I would need to actually look fully at the figures at that, but my, I might be wrong, but my suspicion would be that that will actually take in a huge amount of disabled workers. Um, because if you're a working person without kids, it's very difficult to get tax credits unless you also have a disability that then um, puts you into that criteria. So we so need to look at I that. I would need to look at that, but my suspicion would be that would be a very high percentage of the people. OK, just on that, and then we'll take a few more members. Uh, Lynn first. Just to take your point about um, um, the question, do we really need to um, make sure everybody gets a benefit check? Um, the way the Healthier Wealthier Children project was set up uh, was that it had very broad criteria. So um, the eligibility criteria were an income, a family income of less than, less than £40,000. 
and it, that it was designed that way to catch because tax credits at the time, you know, if you were a family with five children and child tax credits, um, you know, you, that's that was a threshold, thirty nine thousand. So um, during that um, project, we found that um, one in five of all of the um, advice cases were for DLA payments, and a lot of those DLA payments were not for the lowest income group, the ones who were less than 1,399 per month, they were for the next group up from 1,400 to 4,000 pounds a month. So um, there is an argument that um, you know you have entitlement even, depending on your household circumstances, you'll have entitlement even if you have what's considered to be a higher income. Chris? Um. I think it goes back to the need to look at the, the whole picture in terms of the strategy because in an ideal world you should have as few people seeking advice or needing advice as possible. You know, it could almost be an indicator that your system is not working Absolutely. if your demand for advice is, is going up. So we need to kind of keep that in mind that there are people claiming who claim successfully who get no advice, they're getting everything they're entitled to. Um, how you know they how, how are they doing that and how can those groups be expanded as well as those with more complex needs do, do get that advice? Because some, some of these benefits will mean you're more likely to claim other benefits than others. So child, child benefit, there, there may be a lot of people that are just eligible for child benefit, so that may not be a good way of targeting that other support. But you're right, it's looking at how they kind of cross yeah. each other to find those real groups where there's complexity. Yeah, I think... Um, that's a touch on a few of the points in, in terms of who is missing out um, when um, when we sort of recently asked um, advisors by far the biggest um, group they identified was older people followed by um, followed by disabled people um, I think the the sort of the the point about um, increasing take up through work in um, in health settings is a really important one. We've seen the the success that that's had with um, with children's benefits. Um, there's um, some work that um, sort of an, a number of our CABs have got ongoing um, to um, uh, pilot uh, um, uh, sort of advisors embedded within GPs' practices, for instance, and other other healthcare settings. Um, there's a project that's uh, that's recently either starting or started um, to um, provide information about pension credits when people are going for flu jabs um, to target the the older the older cohort. I think in terms of some of the discussions around um, whether um, needs uh, sort of greater greater automation or um, greater advice. I think ideally um, you would have um, you would have both. I think there's a lot um, that can be done. The um, even within the the application process um, to um, uh, make it more straightforward by um, by using using information that people have already given to Social Security Scotland to pre-populate forms. Um, that information can be um, can be used to see if they're entitled to other benefits, but uh, but as as, uh, as Stephen said, it's there, um, there's a real need to to invest in um, in good quality um, independent advice um, because um, consistently when when that's done, we've seen um, consistency around um, around ten pounds of client financial gain for every one pound invested. That it's it's um, it's a, a sort of surefire way to um, to increase benefits take up through through advice. So I think you need you need both sort of automation and simplification of the systems, but also um, but also um, need good independent advice. Leslie, and then I'll ask Keith Brown to come in. Yeah, and well, I just we're talking about benefits linked with children, which is quite a straightforward benefit. I really have got major concerns about the application and the assessment process for disability benefits. And we, we talk about the take up of that being quite low because the process is very stressful and there's a lot of incorrect decisions. And I, and I, I know I've said this before, but I keep coming back to it. I, I, I'm listening to the take up 
been well improved with automatic entitlement for some of the, the less complex benefits. But the benefits that cause us most work are those linked to disability, because we're having to go to appeals uh, or prepare submissions, because in fact we've actually had to cut out face-to-face -face representation with a client. We, we have to give them the submission to go because we don't have the resources, because our decisions that we're getting are so poor, we're, we're inundated with requirements for assistance with appeals. So it's, it's getting it right first time, and you are going to have responsibility for that. And I think that's quite important that you take that on board. That, and that's why people maybe get so frustrated that they don't apply again because they've been turned down. We can't, you know, it's, it, they don't actually go through the whole process because they think once they get that decision, it's not challenged, you know, it can't, can't be challenged. And I have real concerns that the face-to-face -face complexity of this we are not able to 100% provide that because it, we're, we're, we're re receiving so many ill-informed decisions and getting it right first time is just one of the crucial things that we really need to address. Keith Brown. Yeah, I think that last point maybe indicates that the design of the system isn't working if that's the impact it's having, although I do still tend to think that the potential for uh, automation has been hugely underestimated. Uh, I think the point that was made about some advisors having to anticipate future changes is a fair one, and also the other benefits perceived as not being social security benefits, you could think of bus passes and all sorts of other things. I mean, logically, we should be trying to anticipate and uh, address all those concerns, and I think if we can get huge systems of credit references, I think we can have the IT uh, resources to do a proper automation system so that the vast bulk of people can do it pretty much automatically and the advice which will still be required can be targeted at those that most need it. But leaving that aside, two, two questions, only get one chance. Uh, one is on the research. The point that Jeremy started off with and I think Michelle just touched on is why is the take up so low? Now, in this new social security system, we've already had a massive audit um, of that, incredibly, at the very start of it, costing hundreds of thousands of pounds. I'm not aware of, and I'd be interested because the experts here might be aware of, what research has been done to find out to what extent is it because of uh, perceived um, um, not non entitlement, people not wanting to touch benefits, where they'll be happy to, more happy to take on a pension, for example. What percentage? be lack of awareness. So if we know that governments study all these stuff, there's apparently a study on Scottish independence the UK government doesn't want to release. Have they studied I mean, properly, not just those that are getting benefits, but those that they know are not getting them, why they're not being taken up? What kind of research has been done in relation to that? And if governments are committed to maximising take-up, why are they not researching why the take-up is so low. And the, the last point is, the point Alistair started off on, the fiscal framework, I may be misunderstood. I thought the current fiscal framework would penalise any substantial uptake in UK benefits if it happens in Scotland. I thought that was the current situation, and I'm happy to be corrected if that's wrong. If it is right, then I think, for everybody around this table concerned about take-up, that has got to be the most major inhibition there will be on benefit take-ups in Scotland, at the rest of the UK as well, but in Scotland. So shouldn't that be the focus of our activity? If there's no benefit incentive for the government, or if there's a disincentive for them to increase take-up, why would they do it? That's a big concern I have. I'd just be interested in any witnesses' comments on those points. Thanks, Keith. If we take the fiscal framework first, if anyone has anything to want to say on that. Russell, I thought you would... So just to would. repeat a little bit, so um, it's certainly theoretically it's possible that the UK government could try and claim, if it could prove and argue its case, that an increase in take-up in Scotland of UK benefits was down to Scottish government action. Um, however, I suppose in practice, trying to prove that would be a very, very difficult job, given your second question, which is um, they're not doing a huge amount of research into take-up, and never mind um, why they're not even doing a huge amount of research into what the current levels are. So I'm not wanting to be flippant about that risk at all, because it is a risk, and governments do need to be risk-averse, particularly when it comes to what could be quite a large amount of money. On the other hand, I would hate to see a risk aversion creep in um, that would stop very, um, you know, very vulnerable families not getting the payments that they deserve because of a theoretical possibility that could hit Scottish budgets. So theoretically, yes, in practice, it would be very difficult to, to enforce. Anyone else on the fiscal framework before we move on? Rob? 
Yeah, I think on both of the the points, I think the um, part of the the take up strategy, um, a component of that, um, as I mentioned earlier, needs to be um, research on on the take up levels and the reasons for that, because there there, there seems to be um, there seems to be gaps both in in sort of uh, academic studies, but also um, in studies by um, by government into into take up. Um, in terms of the of the the fiscal framework, um, it's um, it's sort of, sort of, um, sort of my, my understanding is that there's there's kind of discussions on ongoing between the two governments. Um, it certainly wouldn't be our our sort of interpretation of the of the sort of no detriment principle, and it would it would be um, it would be concerning if if that's that then related to increasing benefit take up meant that um, meant that the other government had to pick up the bill because I think there's it's something that um, I think there's there's certainly a, a sort of a, there's to be a, a, a shared emotion around benefits take up is is a good thing it um, it prevents poverty um, it uh, prevents spend elsewhere and it shouldn't just be seen as um, as a cost to government, and I think that's that. I think that's potentially um, some of the reasons why um, why there sort of hasn't um, hasn't been the sort of the consistent advertising, the consistent promotion of benefits from government in the past. Um, is that um, is that there's um, about uh, about the, the sort of the increased cost? Um, but I think it's sort of to um, for one of my my favourite of the um, of the social security principles, um, social security is an investment in the people in of Scotland, and um, and that it, it should be seen in that light. Jill's on this one. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to check my understanding of that differential was that if if the Scottish government made a policy change to the benefit that caused an increased cost, that differential had to be funded by the Scottish government. But a straight, you know, make sure you've proclaimed your your universal credit or your pension credit or whatever, you know, just an advertising campaign wasn't a policy change and therefore the bill of any increase would then be picked up by the UK. Is that your understanding? I think that, that would be my, my understanding of it. I don't know what um, what stage the, the kind of the, um, the sort of discussion between between the governments is in terms of in terms of promotion of it. So that it may be a, a sort of question for the uh, question for the, the sort of Scottish government and the UK government. So just before we wind up on that quick technical issue that Keith raises, did you want to come back on that, Keith? Well, as I say, I think there are different interpretations in the deal. I'm quite happy to admit that mine is wrong if, if that is the case, but that wasn't the tenor of previous discussions on the committee. If there is not an inhibition on the Scottish government encouraging and achieving a take-up in UK benefits. That's important to know, and I think what would be quite useful to us have clarity, whether it's Michelle's interpretation, uh, Russell, who's... I think that's broadly correct, what Michelle is saying, and I just wanted to check that was the question yeah. that you put. But it would be useful to have that. And I think, uh, as Rob is saying, there's current discussions between the two governments about the new uh, form of the fiscal framework, which is a scheduled discussion to take place. I think it's really important to know that. Um, in any event, my other point about the research, I think it's the point that was made, how serious are governments about this if they're not doing any research when they'll research other things? And by research, I'm really talking about surveys in some cases. It's not profound academic research, but anyway, that was all. Any, anyone want to come back to Keith on that, Chris? Um, so the, the stigma around benefits is obviously deep-rooted in the, the ways that people think about who is deserving or who is undeserving and the kinds of um, activities that different groups are perceived to, to do or not. So the, the roots of that are deep in the nation's psychology. Um, so they're not some, that's not something that's going to be undone overnight. But um, we at Joseph Rancher Foundation have done some research about how you can speak about poverty and Social Security in a way that doesn't trigger uh, a lot of those negative uh, ways of thinking about poverty and Social Security. Uh, and the Scottish Government uh, are already, I think, using some of that in their own communications uh, around the Social Security Agency and, and how they're talking about some of the devolved benefits. But there are, there are things 
uh, that can be done in the long term about how you speak about benefits and poverty that can, over time, reduce some of the, the stigma that is felt. So I think that's why it, it needs that long-term strategy that, that, that does that at that level, at that national level, that, that helps to prevent low take-up occurring in the first place. Shona Robson? Yeah, it was uh, just uh, picking up on some of the things that have been said. Um, I mean, the, the response from the UK government in the form of like two paragraphs from Alex Sharma, MP, um, referring us to the government website doesn't inspire me with confidence that the UK government is keen on um, promoting take-up of benefits. And I think one of the things that I'm picking up here, and I certainly know from my own constituency, is, is people hearing about the lived experience of others in accessing the, and coming into contact with the system. And I think uh, it would be useful to hear whether people feel that that is quite a strong deterrent. So, you know, hearing about the, the difficulties of, you know, no one ever wins first time round, you only ever win on appeal, which has had a major impact on your service. Um, don't go on any universal credit, it's a nightmare. And how much of that is actually quite a strong deterrent and of the fear factor of, of what people's actual experience uh, would be. And then finally, it would be useful to hear a little bit more from Leslie Newton, given how topical this is at the moment. You, you mentioned at the start about the um, experience of EU citizens coming into contact with the, the benefit system at the moment. Uh, those may be on it or we're about to be on it. And it would be helpful just a little bit more information about that just now or maybe as a follow up in, in writing. Um, given how topical that is at the moment. Well, I'm happy to talk briefly about the experiences that we've had with EU migrants. I mean, we've had the fortunate position of having universal credit um, in our area since 2016, and we had the live service 2015 as a, as a trial. And there's many um, EU migrants who apply for benefit who are told uh, in decision-making that they're not entitled. And in fact, that is not the case, but it's such an elongated process because they get no money on universal credit when they're given that decision and they accrue housing arrears. And, we, you know, and, it, and it becomes a, a really crucial problem because they're not, you know, DWP are not looking at HMRC records, they're not looking at um, children that are in education, they're not looking at people's timelines, and we have to provide that. And it's incumbent on the DWP to provide that information, and they're not, they're choosing not to do it. And I'm not saying that we win every appeal that we go to for that, but we do get a very high success rate. And I do have concerns that now, I suppose we've got a slight better shoe in with um, the EU settlement scheme because once we can get settled status for people, which again um, it, it's picking up, um, where, where we've got people that are able to assist people in getting um, EU settled status, because once you get that, you have an entitlement to benefit. But then there are a number of people that, prior to getting that settled status, are still entitled and we're, we're supporting them with challenging it. And I do have concerns that it, it's convenient to deny people a benefit and allow them to perhaps just go away thinking that's there's no way I can challenge this because I don't actually understand it, uh, added to which they're, they're counting on the fact that a certain proportion of people wouldn't challenge it because they think that's the, the end of the line. And it's getting the message out there um, whilst you know we are a victim of our own success because we, do, we don't have the resources to help everybody, but we, we, we never try, we, we, you know, we don't turn people away and we try to get um, as many people supported as possible, but it is becoming increasingly difficult. Does that address your question, Rob? Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I think I suspected that that was the case. Um, I mean, from what you're saying, then there's a culture of, you know, whether that comes from the, the kind of policy intent or whether it's a culture within the DWP, but that's very concerning to hear uh, that those, you know, that that almost appears to be the, the kind of line. <laughs> there's a change to someone's circumstances who, is, who are in work, who are from the EU, they immediately get put on the habitual residence test again, and it's just not necessary. Um, and even people who have got full right to be here because they've been here and have been working etc still get this so it, it's a miss I, I don't know whether it's a, a deliberate 
way to ensure that some people drop off the radar um, or whether it's just a lack of training and development. Um, I, I just have real concerns that that sector um, are being severely disadvantaged. I think that's something we should follow up with the DWP specifically on that. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Um, just for a point of information, I'm, I'm sure you all know anyway, but just to emphasise that some of the committee's work in the passage of the Social Security Bill was addressing the question of if the agency don't get it right first time, and let's hope that they do, is to smooth the path of the appeals in Scotland at least. And so one of the important aspects of the legislation is that the agency is required to collate all the paperwork to, for the passage of uh, some people supported the automatic appeal, but however, um, where we ended up, I still think it's an important provision within the bill still to be tested. The paperwork should be easier, in theory, uh, where there's an appeal uh, going to the tribunal system from the, from the new agency. Inconsistency in universal credit decisions for limited capability for work as well. Um, we have situations where people are on the legacy benefit of employment and support allowance in the support group and continue to get that because it's contribution based. And because they have uh, a requirement to have their housing costs paid through UC, they're then put through another assessment for UC for their limited capability for work and get zero points. Now, why, how is that possible? Because they will maintain all oh, the descriptors are different. Well, I'm sorry. They can't be. And we have ridiculous scenarios where you have that situation. Um, I don't know if you're familiar, Mr. Balfour, with that. <laughs> no, I mean, I think they are different. I mean, I think, I mean, I think they are different. I mean, I think there are things that I would be entitled to under GLA that I wouldn't be entitled... No, I'm talking about employment support. Yeah, I, yeah. Wouldn't be employ I don't think I would be employment support mm -hmm. compared to... Yeah, I think they are different criteria. Within universal credit, limited capability for work? I don't yeah, I think, I think my understanding that there is, and that depends on what your disability is and how your disability affects you. Yes, but if you've got a legacy benefit where you've been, it has been agreed that you're in the support group because of your disabilities, there shouldn't be a significant difference to the universal credit, limited capability for work dis related activity decision that is made. I'm happy to discuss with you. We'll I, I don't, I don't yeah, want yeah, sorry, to uh, sorry, yeah. give you the technicalities. <laughs> um, so, you know, we, we have real concerns about um, the decisions surrounding universal credit um, for, in particular, people, because what, what happens that they get an employment and support allowance decision that is perhaps negative, and then the only option to then is to apply for universal credit. And a lot of people are put on to that benefit, in my view, unnecessarily, because you then win the Employment and Support Allowance appeal and you cannot come off of universal credit, as we all know. Once you're on that train, you stay on it. And that is, that is concerning to me. Mm -hmm. Another point that ought to be challenged, I think. Russell, Gunson? So on um, uh, both your questions there, Shona, around, so firstly around the use citizens, is a related or potentially overlap issue in terms of no recourse to public funds. Um, so at the moment, it's probably, we don't know, but small numbers of families that are in that situation suffering extreme destitution. Uh, that may or may not go up after Brexit, depending on what happens with immigration and, and asylum um, systems. So whilst it may be smaller numbers, it's an extreme um, level of disadvantage that at the moment is hitting local authorities' budgets quite um, severely. We need to look at that. We're doing some work with Chris's colleagues at JRF in Scotland, uh, looking in part at that uh, in the context of the Scottish child payment, but it's a broader issue that we should keep an eye on, particularly as Brexit plays itself out, if it ever does. Um, the other... To get some... It's quite order. hard to get data, but if mm -hmm. we do, yeah. I'll absolutely share it. Um, Around the other question, um, sort of word of mouth in essence, so there's a negative word of mouth for sure. We've, in the same work, been doing uh, work with lived experience groups around their experience of the UK and uh, sort of uh, burgeoning Scottish social security systems. Um, the word of mouth, the negative word of mouth around the UK system clearly is a drag. Um, Universal Credit has such a bad reputation amongst um, claimants and non-claimants that it was no surprise that it's putting people off claiming. And that comes from a few different, I mean, there's probably infinite numbers, but the, the three biggies are around um, the sort of dignity agenda, so how they're treated through the system, secondly around the forms uh, and the application process, 
and then related to that, the predictability of the payment. So it's reassessed so quickly and so often that people's uh, payments are changing, not actually always with real changes in circumstances either. If you have a, a back pay or a tax rebate, uh, your universal credit payment will uh, be adjusted in inverted commas. So whilst that's the system, or should I say the case for the UK system, we could flip that for the Scottish system. So how do we get a positive word of mouth around how people are treated, around the forms, uh, around the predictability of the payments coming through the agency um, and I guess there's a very you know slightly connected issue around how do we make it's a point that Neil said earlier around the adequacy of payments so often we're topping up through the Scottish system therefore the the weekly payments that we're offering might be at the lower end albeit very very important for the people that receive them how do we band together one application for a number of payments so that it's worth it for applicants um, to go through the process even a very simple one so as an example free school meals at the local level, uniform grant at the local level, and, and the other payments at the local level that local authorities are in control of, can we in any way automate between the new Scottish payments and that local level, which is a slightly different sort of issue from automation between the UK and Scottish level, because then one application might well lead to a larger amount per week, make it worthwhile, add to that positive word of mouth. Thank you. Um, so, uh, well, to, uh, last comment from Neil, then we're going to wind up. Just to follow on from uh, Russell's last point there, I think um, the kind of word of mouth social factors that you asked about are very, very real. So people do, you know, listen to the very real lived experiences of, um, you know, their, their, their friends and their family, um, and that does often lead to people disengaging from the system. I think you can address that in three ways. Um, first point is just to improve the system. So as Russell says, ensuring that it's adequate, ensuring that processes aren't complex, ensuring that people are treated with dignity within the system so that the experiences are just better. Um, but you also do it, I think, through working with um, community-based organisations who have trusted relationships with um, with communities, both communities of place, communities of interest, um, to, to, you know, to better support people um, and to help people you know, get the support they need to actually navigate the system. And then finally, in, in terms of uh, addressing those social factors, the sort of framing work that, um, that Chris mentioned earlier um, is really, really important. It's a longer term project, but it's, you know, it's about changing the narrative around social security and you know, um, ensuring that social security is treated just as the education system is treated, just as the health services is treated and discussed in public discourse. It's something that we all rely upon. It's a collective investment in the well-being of everyone in society. Um, and I think you know, framing social security system in that way in the long term will address some of those social factors as well. Mm -hmm. Very much, Neil. Um, I just wanted to add something to Keith Brown's question about researching to be make sure that we understand all the reasons and all the groups that don't apply. Um, just my own experience um, in casework that I do, single parents is obviously a big one, particularly those who are working, because uh, they very often don't come in contact with any agency because they are working and they don't fill in forms. Uh, second group, uh, interestingly, um, are grandparents. So in Glasgow, for example, there's a high number of grandparents um, just because of social issues in Glasgow who have custody of the children and who uh, are struggling because, because they're not in work and they don't, there's no kind of natural... So if they can get an appointment, if they're lucky enough to get an advice agency and go along and get a, bit, a check to see if they're... Um, there's obviously it's, it's complicated as well because some are foster parents, some are not. There's an issue about the formality um, of the, the arrangement. So I think there's lots of groups in there. It might be small numbers, but um, and, and lastly, I think this question that has been raised around the table of expectations. Um, there's a lot of people out there, particularly I think people who might have been entitled to the working tax credit who just maybe didn't expect to receive anything from the state, so they maybe didn't ask a question in the first place. I remember the introduction of the pension credit system when I was doing my rounds in some of the pension areas. Um, people said to me that they think there's been a mistake. And I know the Scottish Government experienced this recently when, uh, if I had it was Glasgow, when they sent out the clothing grant automatically, they were getting calls saying, I think this is a mistake. Um, because their expectation is that they wouldn't be entitled to anything. So I think that's an important aspect of it. Just in uh, closing, um, I was just going to go around the table. Um, Russell, you've kind of kicked off, um, given the committee some indication of where you think 
the work we should take on because the inquiry that we will be framing shortly is how do we increase the uptake in benefits is the, is the kind of subject matter. So um, if we go around, just go around and start with Steve and just any last words you want to say to the committee about um, how we could take some work forward on the uptake of benefits based on what you've been saying. I think, again, general information <laughs> campaigns are, are fine, but I think there's a low connection between people seeing that information and then actually making the claim. Um, so if, if there's any way to increase the availability a um, high quality advice that that's what I would be looking at because um, for me that's that, that's the best way for somebody to get absolutely everything checked and make sure that everything's maximised rather than campaigns which if, well, could do um, really really good things but it might ultimately only be piecemeal stuff and they might be getting one benefit but there could be other things that they're missing out on Thank you, Neil? Um, yeah, in terms of key points, I guess most of them have already been touched upon I think um, more robust evidence base in terms of you know, being able to uh, analyse who's taking up which benefit would be really, really useful in terms of targeting interventions. Um, I think a focus on people in work who, as we've already touched upon, often don't know their entitlements and find it difficult to access uh, welfare rights advice. Um, I think information campaigns do work, I think, from uh, you know its early days, but it seems to have, you know, the, the, the kind of um, the, the big impact advertising campaign or Best Start Grant seems to have increased um, applications for that, which has been welcome. Um, and as Stephen said, I think investment in welfare rights advice, which, you know, is such a a valuable um, support to people um, will really boost uptake as well. Thank you. Chris? Um, I guess I'll I kind of repeating what I said at the outset that um, we, I think we know enough to have a strategy to increase take up in Scotland already. We don't know everything for sure, but we know enough to try some things out and see if they start to work um, and adjust the strategy, strategy on that basis. But it needs to take account of that high level general awareness, the availability and complexity of the system itself, and then that detailed advice and access on the face-to-face -face basis, it has to pitch it at those three different levels to be effective, I think. Thank you. Lynn? Yeah. Um, could I just follow up on, on a few things that were said in terms of um, health service um, acting as a, a, a mechanism for people to reach good quality mm -hmm. advice, as Stephen said? Um, you know, it's, n it's not only um, particular groups like um, young families or, or pregnant women or people with children. They are a group that will always be um, accessing um, health services. But I think it's really important to remember that um, co-location approaches that are happening now in GP practices are really important. Um, and they're picking up all sorts of need. It's a general population attending GPs. You, you'll catch everyone. And they're picking up all sorts of levels of need. For instance, um, the um, co-location um, initiative in Glasgow in deep end GP practices. These are deep end GPs are, are the ones operating in the 100 most deprived areas in Scotland. And um, 80 of those areas are in Glasgow. So there's a, a programme at the moment where um, money advice is co-located in GP practices. And um, that was evaluated fairly recently. And over the course of a year, um, they had, uh, let me just, ch I'll give you the, right, the proper figures. Um, they had 40, 450 people engaged with money advice, uh, resulting in 1.5 million in financial gain. And half of that financial gain was for disability related benefits. So um, it's a good avenue for, um, for getting a wider population. Leslie. Obviously, I'm going to say investment in advice services because I, I think it's important that everybody has the opportunity to get um, a discussion and an understanding of what they're entitled to. But getting the decisions right first time is really one of the main concerns that I have um, because it is at the moment it's quite limited to get a first time decision that is correct. And ensuring that we are wall working together because I think there's so many different partnerships out there that we could work more collaboratively, um, not least of which the DWP could perhaps be a bit more proactive in allowing us some form of trusted partnership and that's something that we're looking forward to with the Scottish Government that you know obviously your field workers are going to work closely with other advice agencies and that we don't duplicate things and that we work collaboratively to ensure that the clients are getting um, all that they are entitled to. 
Thank you, Rob. Um, I think in terms of, of kind of top priorities, um, there's probably the things. One is on the this, the process itself, um, um, making sure that the application processes, the eligibility rules, the assessments for benefits are as straightforward as they possibly possibly can be. Um, that will. Um, get a lot easier to apply and I think over the long term will help reduce sort of some of the the kind of the fear that people have around um, benefits because they've had bad experiences or they've sort of given up or been put off by by the process um, sort of automating sort of elements of the process where eligibility information is already known um, whether that's because Social Security Scotland holds hold to the data or whether it's possible to um, get information from DWP um, and to um, sort of echo the some investment in um, in independent advice I think this it's um, the um, which is it's a way that's that's consistently shown to, to sort of increase increase benefit take up um, um, in, in, and will generate a sort of a huge a huge return on on investment Thank you. Russell? Yeah, and so I agree with a lot of what's been said. So rather than duplicating, I'd, I'd add to it. So I think the first point would be around reducing the number of hoops that applicants have to jump through. Um, and there's two main areas within that. So there's automation, at least for some, between the UK system and the Scotland system. How can we get GDPR right and data sharing right for that to happen? The second aspect of that hoops point is within Scotland. There's plenty we can do without DWP um, around between the, the agency level and the local level and within the agency level. So for example, Best Start grant and the new Scottish child payment, it would be disastrous if there was anyone uh, getting one and not the other, given how similar the eligibility criteria are. The second and last point would just be that point I started with, which is to recognise that in terms of take up, often the Scottish benefits are only, you're only eligible for it if you're in receipt of a UK benefit rather than eligible for a UK benefit. Um, so how do we make sure that those that we want to help but can't because they're not in receipt of a UK benefit can still claim Scotland benefit? So to get tangible, a backup application route as a sort of norm for the Scottish payments rather than just relying on passporting from UK benefits could be a way to get at those people that are eligible for UK payments but not in receipt. Thank you very much and thank you very much to everyone um, for your time this morning and for your contribution. It's really very valuable. Uh, the committee will now um, go into private session shortly, but we'll discuss everything that's been said and we'll frame our inquiry and hopefully we can engage with you further throughout the course of the inquiry. So thank you very much.